All right. Well, Will and Kate Conwell, welcome to the program. Thank you for having us. Yeah, I was so excited that our Wives Care Director, Gigi Hopkins, uh, Kate, had sent your information over to us because we're always looking for just additional places where there can be some good resources for um, wives that are dealing with betrayal trauma healing. And um, also, we love to connect with uh, stories with people who have stories of redemption. And that's why I was super excited to be able to have you guys on today. And um, before we actually dive into your story, um, Kate, would you mind sharing a little bit about what you actually do in your your ministry? I'd love to. Yeah. So because of my story, I now am using what we went through to help other women like you said, that are dealing with it, dealing with the hurt and the pain of um, betrayal in their marriage. So I offer a community online where you can join and we have meetings in person, kind of like a Zoom meeting uh, twice a week. We're just checking in. It's a safe place to kind of share what you're experiencing. And then we learn together too by reading reading a book. Like once a quarter, we kind of switch books and we discuss it. So it's a safe place safe place to kind of navigate through, be known inside of your pain and to just be with other women who get it. And so you don't like, which I think knowing you're not alone is such a huge, has such huge value. And we'll, you'll hear more about that later. And then I also help women one-on-one through coaching and, and walking in a more personalized way through step-by-step, like, where are you? What are we working towards? Like, how can we get you to the other side of healing in a very personalized way from woman to woman. So it's called Journey Beyond Betrayal. And those are the two things that I offer right now for women. That's great. And that's the website too, right? Journeybeyondbetrayal.org or com? Dot com. Socials, all the same. Journey Beyond Betrayal. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll circle back around to that at the end here (laughs) to, to point people to that resource. But yeah, I'd love for you guys to share your story, but maybe before we even get to the nuts and bolts of of what your story is, can can both of you share maybe a little bit of why sharing our stories is so important um, when we're maybe trying to help other people who have experienced similar circumstances? Yeah, it's interesting. We thanks for asking that question. Uh, oftentimes, we we will whenever we get an opportunity to share. Um, we'll end with that in the sense of trying to encourage others to share their stories because w- like we both believe in, let's say it's been a long journey to get to this place. So I understand that this isn't where we started, but where we believe and and where we are now is that sharing our stories is a critical component to, it's our testimony, right? Like it is how God has redeemed our relationship, it redeemed each of us individually. And if we're not willing to share it, there's there's two components to it. One is by sharing it, we invite other people to start sharing their stories and start their journey to say, okay, I need to deal with this. There's hope on the other side. There's other people that have been through it. Um, what I'm experiencing, I'm not alone. Others have already been through this. Okay, cool. Now I have kind of a roadmap and I and a relationship. I can reach out. You know, people can contact us. They can contact you and say, okay, I need help. So we like to share for that reason. And then the other side, which is you know, a little deeper on the spiritual side, I guess, for me personally, is that it's something that I feel is, is what God has asked me to share. So I don't want to, oftentimes I'm like, you know, I have other things to do. I also don't want to continually talk about my past sin. It's not a lot of fun, but it, but it is a way of, it's like, it's like Satan's attempt to say, don't talk about it. And God's attempt to say, talk about it, put it out in the open, be real and and through that we get to build relationships with each other and then also get to like get to know God better and what he's capable of i just there's more to be said in that i don't yeah. want to say too much all at the very beginning but it's like we have to and we and and i think she probably enjoys it a little more than me because i was the i'm like the bad guy no but it well we'll get into that i mean but um but in it every time that we share other people, we hear story after story after story of other people saying, I heard your story and it allowed, and like, that was the beginning of my journey to, to having a new life, you know, a redemption and enjoy again and a new relationship, hopefully with the same person, maybe with somebody else, but there's, yeah, 
Okay. Yeah. There's just power, I think, in sharing because Satan wants us to believe that we're alone and you're not alone. And, and no matter what you're experiencing, whether it's like infidelity, like we went through or some other thing that you're hearing that voice of like, I'm alone. Nobody understands. Like, it's not true. And so when people share their stories of what they've been through, it, it allows that opportunity for you to like confirm that you're really not alone. Yeah. Well, so now we're, uh, we're eager to hear your story. So why don't you guys share with us just the road that you have traveled to this point in your relationship? We'll start at the beginning. We, we met in college. We both competed for the University of Washington on the track team. And so go Huskies. Uh, that, that's, where we, that's where we met each other and started. Freshman year. Fr- yep, end of freshman year. Um, and we dated for two years and then broke up and had kind of an on and off, very unhealthy relationship for the remainder of college. And for the sake of time, I'll just skip through this quickly. We ended up getting back together. Um, right after I was done with college and saying kind of, this is it, like either we're going to be in this or we're not going to try this anymore. Um, and we ended up engaged and married a year later. And, um, then do you want to take it from there? Uh, yeah. Like, so, so throughout that entire time, like, um, hmm, let's see, how do you say this any better? You know, you can only be aware of what you are aware of. I guess you could say, right? You only know what you know, and you don't know what you don't know. And Kate hadn't dealt with lust and like, you know, wanting other relationships and and having inappropriate like pornography or any of those things. I had, but I didn't know how to talk about it. So like starting back all the way through elementary, you know, like 12 years old was the first Playboy I ever saw at a buddy's house, pulled open his dad's drawer in the office, and there was a 100 Playboys there. And at 12 years old, we didn't know what we were looking at. But I knew there was something that was like, this is amazing. And I want to see every single page in every one of these books. Nobody taught me to want to see that. Nobody like told me not to see it, like specifically, right? The idea was like, well, just don't look at stuff like that. With And so I didn't know what was happening. There was like the seed planted in me. That seed continued to grow all the way through college. And so during our relationship, and then we would break up and there was constantly this drop. We couldn't separate because we're on the same team, right? So it's like, get away oh, from him, this, the right? The same track, track team. team. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. We we couldn't like, in, a lot of people in college can just like, oh, let's leave. I'm never going to talk to that yeah, person again. That was not possible. We had to, in, like, we had to see each other because of what we were doing. So I guess what I'm, the reason I'm putting that, that context is because there was a piece of me that was secret and hidden and sinful and like lustful and you know, um, that she didn't know about. And I didn't want her to know about it. I was never going to tell her about it. I was going to fix it and not deal with it. And that way we never have to talk about it. And I couldn't, that doesn't sound how it works. Like anybody that's hearing this now, that's like, well, like a lot of people have made this promise. I'm never going to do it again. Um, you know, I've, I'm never looking at pornography again. I'm never going to have another affair. I'm never going to, you know, have the inappropriate sexual behavior. And then there's this promise to God, there's this promise to self, and it's just not enough. The the sin has too much power. And that's why we do what we do now, but we'll get into that. Um, so that was going on in the background. Our relationship was breaking up and coming back together. Eventually, we did get engaged. Um, during that time, remember this whole time I'm unhealthy. So like in our engagement process, like right before, I don't know, not right before, but a few months before we got married up to that point, I was technically a virgin, but whatever that means in modern day society, um, anything but intercourse, you could say, right. So it's technically a virgin or, or that's how I viewed myself. I, um, you know, we stepped outside of our dating relationship, our engagement relationship and had sex with somebody else. And she didn't know. And I was never going to tell her. And I wasn't happy with myself for doing that. Um, I wasn't even sure why I did it. Uh, I still don't really know. Like, I didn't have thought. It was very uh, carnal, if you could say it that way. Like, and alcohol. And, like, um, just worldly. Um, Not for the sake of wanting another relationship. Just for the sake of having no self-control. Like, very poor self-control of my sexuality. Um, So, I hid that 
into our marriage. She didn't know. Yeah. We got married. Our The first several years of our marriage were oh. not easy. Oh, they were so hard. We so, fought all the time. We're very both strong-willed people. <laughs> I mean, we would like fight and then... I would slam the door and go into the other room and lock the door. And then she would like go outside and flip the lights on and off on the porch one time, just to get me to like re-engage because she was like, uh, we're going to talk about it. I mean, she still is. And I was a, no, we're not right. I'm going to avoid. Yeah. So I want to ask too, up to this point, uh, what was what was your what were your faith backgrounds to this point, and what what kind of impact, mm-hmm. if any, did that have on your relationship in this new marriage? I became a Christian in college, like pretty, like only a few months before we started dating. So I grew up like knowing about God, believing in God, but like not knowing about a relationship with Him. Just like believing that He was there, like praying occasionally, but not like really understanding that I like the salvation piece of it. And so I became a Christian in college right before we dated, which then did I, I looked to him a lot because he's the son of a pastor, been a Christian his whole life. So I'm like, well, he knows way more than I do because I'm just a baby Christian and he has been living this his whole life. So like, if he, if he says this is okay, like then it must be okay. Oh, come on. Um, and um, not, not the pornography. I didn't know about all of that, but like just some of the decisions we made in our relationship. So I was a new Christian, but had a very strong faith. Like I would say, although I became a Christian later, it grew my, the depth of my faith grew. And as I went on, like I was a part of athletes in action and got heavily involved. There was an intern with them even after college. And so when we got married, it was like right after my internship ended with athletes in action. Yeah, it was interesting. And so I grew up as as a, in a Christian household. Dad is a pastor, like a lot of my relatives, Christians. It was great. It was amazing. Big part, you know, lots of relationships in our church. It was all really healthy. One of the things I learned at a young age was in my family, or at least what I thought I learned, what I took from it anyway, was to not talk about sin. Like, Like, don't show it to anybody. Don't talk about it. It just shouldn't be happening. And so if it is happening, that's wrong. Don't do it. You know, read your Bible, pray, and don't do it, (laughs) Uh, whatever the sin is. Um, So I developed like really good lying and coping mechanisms to try to figure it out and deal with it myself, which wasn't, didn't work. It totally didn't work. Um, Which is interesting because even though I didn't grow up in like a faith background, family of faith, like our core values were like, be honest. Honesty yeah, sure. was a yeah. core value of our family. So, which was interesting, yeah, because I wasn't good at being honest. So, yeah. So then you you said you know first few years in your marriage, there's all this conflict that's going on. At, at what point did uh, well? First of all, what what happened in the marriage, uh, Will, around your secret sexual brokenness issues? Like, where did that go yeah. in the marriage? Right. Right. So so it led to like me wanting physical intimacy with her, but it not ever being like real true intimacy because I wasn't being totally vulnerable. She didn't know me. I wouldn't let her know all of me. I couldn't because I was hiding part of myself. Right. So she always sensed there wasn't full intimacy in our relationship, even though I was always wanting physical intimacy. That wasn't the the depth of intimacy that our relationship deserved or could have had that then, you know, with my own sexual sin and lust and lying led to five years into our marriage. I went on a trip for athletics and had a bunch of alcohol and ended up having an affair with, you know, a somewhat random person that I wasn't interested in for a relationship, but was, yeah. So it, so it messaging. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. So it, it, yeah, it led to a physical affair. Um, and then I said, I will never talk about that. No one's ever going to know about it. And I'm going to bury that and it'll go away. Just like I thought I could do all the way up to that point. And it was buried until we were managed. We were managing some apartments and I picked up his phone and saw some messages with another woman. Not the one that I had the affair with. Like, I just couldn't, I couldn't fill the void of wanting other people to engage with me in a way that, 
made me feel like cared about. And it sounds, sounds odd. Maybe if you, if you never have felt that way, but if, if you're listening and you have felt that way, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. Well, there's oh, something, there is something, um, especially for guys that have had a history of early exposure to pornography and some of those thoughts and those ideas. And plus weave into that the very clear moral teachings of Christianity that say, hey, that's out of bounds. There's going to be a lot of confusion and a lot of shame, a lot of guilt. And then I think sometimes, and tell me if this is if this is some of your experience, Will, there's something just incredibly enticing and alluring with the the um the chase, the romance, the the idea of just attraction but it never goes to any kind of mature level of relationship. There's a sense in which I just want to, there's a, I want to be um, uh, wanted. I want to be seen. I want to be, you know, involved in these fun things. But as soon as something says, I've got to sacrifice, I've got to be vulnerable. I've got to be mature. It's like, I'm out. I don't know if that was your experience, but I've seen that happen many times with men who are on that kind of trajectory. Yeah, you, you hit it on the head. And I think the hardest part was that I can see all of it now. But when I was in it, I couldn't see the other side. I almost thought this is who I am. This is always who I'll be. And I don't even know how to engage in the world in an appropriate way, because the way I want to engage with women around me and in my relationships is so on. I, now I would deem it as unhealthy. But at the time, it was, it was like the only way I knew and it gave me an adrenaline hit and it was exciting and it was, you know, enticing and all the things that maybe somebody would say, like when they first started doing some like hard drug and go like, well, I didn't really know. And then I tried it and I couldn't stop. Yeah. Now, Kate, when you see these texts, what mm-hmm. happens next and where do things go in your mind and what kind of conversation, like what happened then? Well, you, mm-hmm. you've always been pretty relaxed. <laughs> So she was, she didn't really take it too serious. So I immediately confronted him. There wasn't really a lot of thought, like, what am I going to do about this? He was downstairs, I guess, down at the bottom level of the apartment. And I just like went down there and was like, what is this? Uh, Showing him the phone, asking him about the messages. And uh, then he tried to deny it, but this was really not like, any way to deny what was in front of his our both of our faces now and so then over that he was caught like i okay i was messaging this person it was very sexual messages but didn't turn into anything and i'm like okay well is that it like what else have you been lying about now i know you've been lying what else have you been lying about no nothing okay i don't know like days or out like I don't know what the, it's hard to remember the exact timeline. This is now 11 years ago, but it's a pretty short timeline there there between that. And then like two and a half weeks, more and more things got disclosed over that, that period of time. But she did a great job of like not being afraid of what she was going to find. I mean, maybe you were afraid of it, but she went, she wanted all the information and she started like contacting friends and all the people that we both knew and asking him, like, has has my husband been inappropriate? Has he said these kind of things to you before? And well, yeah, because you said as you can assume I've messaged like everybody but a handful of people, like kind of just with little like things that would seem innocent enough, but like depending on how they would respond. I would I would have an like, excuse like, oh, I'm just a flirty kind of guy. You know, I don't mean anything by it. I just have a tendency to be a little flirtatious, which was my cover, right? Like, not I didn't. It, I don't, I didn't design this. It happened organically. Like now looking back at it is I'm not like a master manipulator. I'm not smart enough to be that way. It just happened. Um, but you're very smart. (laughs) Well, that's one thing I think that we, we can't recognize will when we're in the middle of it is just how, uh, creative our sin nature can be and how, you know, it's like you had, you you might even and, and and again looking back you might have a lot more clarity now but guess what from the age of 12 you were being groomed and trained towards some of these outcomes that were happening now in your marriage right cuz pornography was teaching you it was teaching you to be a taker it was teaching you to be about pleasure it was teaching you to be about you know no consequences it was teaching you about how to hide how to you know so and yes i agree so many of those things can be happening on kind of a subconscious level when we're teenagers 
But now you're being confronted with the reality of, okay, this is now out in the light. Like there has been something, there's been a phone shoved in your face by a woman who loves you that says, what's this all about? And so yeah. help us understand then what happened over the weeks and months after that for both of you, because, mm -hmm. you know, Will, you're confronted and now what are you going to do being faced with your secrets? Kate, how are you starting? How are you dealing with this new information that is a huge blow to your trust in your husband? Mm -hmm. So the, yeah. and, and the question you can go first, but the question you just asked is perfect because that what what we often see with other people that we work with is how they respond at that moment. And, and how serious they take it and like the, the, the priority they move it to in their life is maybe like, like the simplest answer to how, how quickly their recovery will come, whether it's a recovery individually or as a couple, which that's, we can't determine that only that couple will determine that. But yeah, so here we go on what we did. So I was pursuing the information like, well, I have this piece now, what else is there? What else it's coming out? So all those things that he mentioned, like the physical affair when we were married, that came out. The physical affair before we were married, that was the last piece to come out. And at that point, when those two, and I was already separated from him at that point. I had said, when I learned about the pornography and the texting, I had taken, we had a one-year-old at the time, taken him down to be with my family um, and to try to just get some space. And then when I found out about the physical affairs, I was like, well, now I'm really out. <laughs> um, I didn't know what to do, really. And and so I called some of our friends. I went to stay with, we had just moved across the country from Alabama back to the Northwest. So I went back to Alabama with our son to just kind of be taken care of. I, I shared with them, like, this is what's happened. I can't take care of myself. I can't take care of my son. Like, can you take care of me? <laughs> and I, and they did. Wonderful group of women They there. did. And I lived with one of them for a couple of weeks and just got to grieve essentially what I didn't realize I was doing then, but like just feel all those broken feelings of like, this is terrible. Like I knew this was terrible. I didn't know what I wanted for my marriage. I knew I was like completely broken. And I I just let myself feel all those things though. Like didn't try to like pretend like it wasn't a big deal, accepted it for what it was and just kind of started to like mourn it. Yes. And someone did share that with me, like kind of early in the process, like you need to grieve what you've lost. Um, and so even though we hadn't lost our marriage, like just lose some but of you the, really had them. You had like, it yeah. wasn't real. It wasn't based in what I she, yeah, yeah. lost. It's like my my identity as like the only person he'd ever been with and 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 some other things as well. So I was there. I could just sit in my feelings. I had people taking care of me. And then I got to the place where I was like, OK, I can't stay in this basement, like literally the basement <laughs> forever. Huh. Um, I need to do something about this. So I started reading books. I started like trying to figure out how to deal with this. I, I ordered books from Amazon, like started anything I could. My favorite book from that time was Shattered Vows by Deborah Lasser and read, read a lot of books just to try to understand like, what am I experiencing? And, and we're still talking. I'm at this point, I'm like, I don't know what I want for the relationship. Like I'm not even making a decision about that right now. Um, but I do, we would still, we were still in contact and he's telling me all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't believe a word that you're saying. Like, right. Like my words had no value yeah. anymore because I, I was a liar. Right. Yeah. So I'm trying to just, I am asking him for information and he's being very forthcoming with all of it. He didn't, you know, at, once everything was out, he, it was out and it was over. It's like, Fine, full surrender. Like I'm done with this. I don't want to be this person anymore. Anyway, finally, I can be free from this burden, and and I can just start over. So we've said like the rock. He he's carrying this rock, and then it comes. Now he's free, feeling free. His oh, I sin. felt so good. <laughs> finally, and I'm now carrying it. I didn't feel good about what I did to her. I felt so good to not have that secret and that burden of high of hiding everything. It was finally just gone. It was, I'm, I'm dead to my past. I, I get reborn, you know, okay, I'm going to commit my life to Christ. There's, a, there's, there's a lot to that cool, the Michael cool side of the journey. Um, and, and I'm fresh and I'm new and that's my old self. And that person is dead and that's not me anymore. And she's like, Oh yeah, it is. You did those things. I'm like, that wasn't me though. And it's like, oh, okay, we got to figure out how to, how to do this. 
so so when that's happening so there's this really cool piece can i do i have a second to there's this really cool piece where i had finished throwing i was a discus thrower i'd like coached at a couple of division one universities and competed at the olympic trials a few times and 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 i thought i would just go into coaching and i, I was it made perfect sense and and i didn't get a single interview like when we finished i finished my career in 2012 i didn't get a single interview no but it was like what is wrong? What is going on here? And then we, that's how we got this job and managed this apartment back in Renton, Washington. Why Renton? Who cares? You know, we have some family nearby, but okay, we'll go back there and do, manage an apartment building. I guess we both have our degree and we're both like high level athletes. We'll go manage an apartment, I guess. And, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen next in our life. Then all this gets exposed. And now I'm like totally lost. And I call one family member who I know who had been through a difficult tumul tumultuous relationship that had had infidelity involved in it. And I call my relative and I say, look, I don't know what to do. I don't know who to talk to. I, I've, I've never been open or honest about any of this. And the person goes, well, where are you? And I said, I'm in Renton, Washington. And he goes, well, there's a couple that helped my wife and I 20 years ago or 15 or 20 years ago. And they walked through us and they said that somebody else in our family would reach out in the future that when they did, they would clear their schedule for this person and help them. And he goes, here's their number. They live just outside of rent in Washington. That's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. So then as you're going through this recovery process and obviously you're getting connected with some outside help, where, when, and, and where did you feel like you maybe started to turn a corner towards saying, the the option that we want to go for is restoration because hmm. kate i can't imagine that you know that was just always <laughs> like what your <laughs> thought was i mean i think a, a wife that goes on all those roller coaster of emotion uh clearly you've got even a biblical out here in terms mm -hmm. of just being able to say i can start all over i don't have to keep reinvesting into this relationship so maybe for you first, Kate, when did you feel like you wanted to start coming back into and working towards restoration? And then what did that look like for you guys as a couple? Yeah, so he he did start meeting with that couple and I knew what he was doing and I was aware of like all the things he was doing because he was 100% towards restoration from the moment that it, he got exposed. And I was the one that was like, I don't know, like you said, I'm on this roller coaster of emotion. So I think... I spent that time in Alabama and I had seen him, you know, like doing some things to work towards restoration. I saw his commitment to his own healing and like his desire for us to be reconciled. And so by the time I came back, I wasn't like, okay, we're, I'm working towards restoration, but I was like willing to meet with the woman who was, was the couple that he mentioned, Delwyn and and I was willing to do that for myself. And then eventually, after seeing enough, I was like, okay, well, maybe we could, maybe we could rest, restore. Like at this point, it's been like six or eight weeks, and I've seen kind of enough of a consistent pattern of his commitment. So I was like, okay, well, I'm not saying I'm in, but I'm willing. And now from here, like you can, you need to continue to show me that, that this is like for real. And so it was just like a watching of, of him. Like, what is he doing? Is he, is, are his words and his actions lined up now? Like I'm, I'm putting some things out there. Like, this is what I need from you. If you want the relationship, this is what I need. So I was very clear with like, they weren't boundaries. They were like needs. Um, there were some boundaries in place, but this was more like, if you want to restore the relationship, I need X, Y, Z from you. Um, he would do everything that I asked, uh, and so it was just me stating what I wanted if it was going to, and then watching him to see if he could do it. Like that's, that's really hard. I realized like, and I remember back then, like when you say, this is what I need. And, and if I can't have it, I'm not willing to be in the relationship. One, you have to really mean that you have to mean that you're not going to be in the relationship. And, and so I wouldn't say that if you don't mean it, but also like I'm being now vulnerable because I, I'm saying this is what I need. And he, it's up to him to, to do it. Like I can't force him to do it. And I remember being like, okay, I've, I've laid these like clear lines in the sand and now I can't make him do it. Like I can't make him want to be married. 
to me, like, and this is what it means, if, like, in my mind to be married. If he wants to be married, he'll do this. And so that's a, like, really vulnerable place to be. But I was like, honestly, if he's not willing to do this, it means he he's not serious. He doesn't want to be married. Why would I want to be married to him? Mm -hmm. And so that was that kind of mental process is what I was going through. And, and every time I would ask for something, he would, he would do it. We also had a one-year-old. So I yeah. like, was high, I was m that motivated. Honestly, I don't know if we didn't have him, if, if like where we would have gone, but his, him being there and like, okay, we're, we're tied for 17 more years. <laughs> right. And there was another son conceived in the reconciliation process. So now there's, there's 18, 19 years. <laughs> it, 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 nice. there was, that was brought up a few times in the beginning was like, well, that she considered it more because we had a son, you know, I mean, yeah. it, it wouldn't well, be clean I, break no matter what, right after that. Yeah. And, you know, I, as a Christian, I look at that as the providence of God in your relationship, you know, that there's this yeah. child that was there as part of a part of the reconciliation. Even I do have a, I want to ask a question as we kind of start uh, aiming towards landing the plane here. Um, you know, we, we know that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So obviously, you guys couldn't keep doing what you had been doing prior to this discovery and disclosure if you were going to have a different kind of relationship. Mm -hmm. Can you highlight maybe just a few key things that have been radically different in terms of what you have done since this discovery and disclosure and recovery and all of that versus the things that might have been part of your relationship prior to that that weren't so healthy and weren't so good. So what are the key elements that you've discovered in this restoration process that are you super important for your new relationship? Yeah, the that's a great question. Keep landing the plane, you just yeah. asked a loaded question. Yeah, let's see. We got about two well, more hours to answer that question. Um, we're certainly, no, we it may be, take a little while to land. So, you know, no, we, I mean, we can be succinct, but that so essentially it was right. Like, what, what she had to do was be aware. She had to be aware that this is a reality and it's something that I needed to, to deal with, but that she had to be aware that was a real thing going on in our past. And so she needed to be willing to, to look it in the eye, right? And also then you know, engage with me and, and as I went through that process, right. If she wanted to, if we wanted to have a relationship and then on my side, and I'm not speak for you, you can add to that. But then on my side was I had to, one, I had to be in a community group of, of other men who we could openly talk to. So I first went to prodigals up in, was it Renton, Washington? I think. Um, then I went to celebrate recovery, um, which was a little bit more lively and more like, um, a church service kind of. And then I found 423. 423 is where I ended up. That's where I'll point people to now. I love it. It's 423 communities. It's a group of men that, you know, there's all sorts of groups around the country. We meet on Zoom. We meet in person. They're my best friends. Like I've been in the group for 10 years, two hours a week. For me, it's every Monday night. I've been a leader in that group. After the first six months, I became a leader. That, I, I needed that. I needed a place to go and to be openly talk and be real about my sin, my thoughts, my fears, and for other guys in the group not to give me advice, but to just listen and go, cool, thanks for sharing. And then we how read. Did, how did that group experience change how you began to communicate with Kate? That's the thing. Go ahead. I, I, that's what I was going to say, I guess. It's like, I think one of the things that that changes and continues. I mean, it's it's an area of growth that I don't think you can ever like achieve. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. It's like understanding why you're doing something and and then communicating with each other, like open and honest communication. Um, and and then looking at yourself and also understanding that in the other person, like, okay, well, this is why they're behaving that way. This is why they're doing that. This is why maybe I'm doing it. Maybe I don't understand why I'm doing it, but I'm like asking myself questions of like, well, why did that bother me? Or why did this feel this way? And so this like self-exploration of like what I'm what I'm what I'm doing and also what he, he's doing and where that comes from and the roots of that, I think is huge in our relationship. And it's like in the last 11 years, I mean, it started really small, but now like yeah. we have so many conversations That's around great. like well, the reason I'm saying this is because I'm really feeling this. And, mm -hmm. and like, so I'm, when I say that, I'm really like afraid, but I'm, I'm yelling at you. 
<laughs> it's it's a it's really hard to conceptualize until you go through it, right? It's like it's like when you first have your first child and you see the baby and all of a sudden you love them unconditionally. You can explain that all you want. When you see it and feel it, you go, "Oh, I get it now." And that's how it feels to us. Is like people go, "Oh, you should be self aware and have all these good conversations." Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But now that we're in it, we're like, "Oh, this is what people were talking about." And like, like healthy, we give a perfect healthy marriages. I was just telling this to someone like healthy marriages are not two people that like can read each other's mind. And he just perfectly knows exactly what to do. And, nice. and he's amazing. And he, you know, and she's like do, fulfilling all of his needs, maybe because they're communicating about it. Like they're talking and they're having fights and they're also talking and they're using their tools to communicate. It's so, all communication. So let me give this perfect example. Like, like the other day, so our son was being really disrespectful. You know, he's 12, he's becoming a teenager. Right. And, 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 and I turned in, I started yelling at him and I like grabbed his shirt and I'm like, ah, you can't talk to me that way. You're being disrespectful. And then, and then I pull out of that situation. She comes over afterward. We're just alone. And she goes, did you like it when your college coaches treated you that way? I go, well, he's got to respect me more. And she goes, right. The same way other people treated you when they wanted your respect. Did you like that? I'm like, no, I hated that. She's like, then why are you treating him that way? And I was just like, you know, like, perfect. I want to engage. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better dad. And I'm willing to go, yeah, I don't want to act that way. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Let's all work on that. And let's work on that. And I wouldn't have done that before. I totally would have been like, well, you don't know me. And, blah, blah. you know, like I would have put a defense up because I didn't want self-exploration or I couldn't handle it or I didn't know what it was. And it felt very uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. We talk about that all the time, um, uh, especially for the men that need to recover from, uh, you know, sexual strongholds and everything is that um, underneath is a very emotionally stunted, immature little boy. And we don't say that in a shaming way. We say that in a way of saying, hey, your most of your recovery, and especially if you're going to have a healthy relationship, is learning to have that little child grow up and be able to then receive constructive criticism and receive feedback and be able to be open to all of that. And there's a maturing that happens in that. As we as we wrap up here, I want I would love for both of you. Uh, Will, for you to speak to the men out there and Kate, for you to speak to the, the women, the wives out there and just what would kind of be your message of hope that you would want to give to them, no matter where they may be on this continuum of, of healing, whether they are maybe still in the dark, but they just sense like, Kate, they might, you know, I do believe that God has given women some special abilities in a realm that men don't have in terms of being able to just kind of sense things and know things, even if they don't know exactly what it is. Maybe there's wives in that situation, or maybe disclosure has happened, or they're in the middle of the whole restoration process. Just what would you want to say to the couples out there? Yeah, I think I'll I'll start where you left off with is like there's this little boy that's in there. And and I think oftentimes women are like expecting they're married to a man and and we're expecting kind of someone to be mature and and all these things. And that's that, you know, we all have different areas where we're struggling and our our need development. And so like to understand, especially if this is in like it doesn't actually have anything to do with you. This is not about you and like some lack in in you or you as a wife or you as a woman or you as a person, but that, that this is really about that little boy who needs some development. And unfortunately, like you've been put as his partner. And so to look at it from a bigger picture and see like, okay, how can I step back and see this isn't about me? It doesn't have any reflection of my worth or value. Mm. But that like my, like as a woman, your value and is determined by God. It was determined before you were born. And, and so nothing that anyone says or does can take away from that because it was already established before any of this happened. And so just knowing that about yourself and then also understanding that like everything that your spouse does doesn't have to do with you. Like, yes, like we're in relationship and so we can support one another and, and learn and grow and communicate better. But like everything doesn't have to do with you. Their behavior, their words are not always just about you. They're about like what they're experiencing and what they're going through as well. And so like kind of learning that, that you're, uh, is I think is hugely important for marriages, no matter what you're dealing with. 
Like there's roots of every issue that, that are like beyond the marriage and each individual person brings those to the marriage. And then now you have two imper imperfect people trying to work towards this amazing marriage and it's going to take work, but it's so worth it. Like the work when you both are invested in it will, de will result in something so beautiful and so much better. Mm, I love that. Yeah, geez, it's almost like you do this like full time. What a great answer <laughs> um, for the guys. Um, I guess I've, there's a there's a few things. I'll be I'll be short, but I want to be clear. A couple of things is if you want to work on your marriage, if you are married and you want to work on your marriage, work on yourself. So if you focus on your marriage and you haven't developed yourself, your marriage will not improve. It will it may improve very slowly. If you work on yourself, your marriage has a chance to exponentially improve. That being said, when you're working to work, most people to work on yourself, what you have to be willing to do is get into a community. You have to be willing to start talking and reading and processing about your emotions and your past and why you feel the way you do. And you go, oh, I'm just angry. Okay, why? Well, I don't know. Okay, let's talk about that more. And, I, you know, I get it. We go as a guy, we go, I don't want to sit in a counselor's office and lay on a chair and have somebody tell me that I had a bad childhood. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about sitting around a room with 10 other awesome pe men who lead, who are leading their families and their businesses and, you know, whatever else, or they're, they're anywhere along that journey, and they're willing to do life together. That's what I would say is find those people. They exist. Mm -hmm. You think right now, I thought they didn't exist. And I thought, well, I can't share my story. It's great. You find random people you've never met before. And there's all sorts of communities. We, four, two, I mean, that's what you guys Yeah. Do. Like, that's what they, yeah. There's there's so many options. There you go. So you're, you literally offer them that. So if you're listening to this, you're not already in a community. Like, why? What are you afraid of? And I get it. Like, people's, there's a fear to be known. But to be known allows us then to to start to know ourselves. Okay, okay, I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with this. In order to truly follow, are most of our followers Jesus? Are most of our listeners Jesus followers? A lot of Christians out here. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so so it, this is what I believe. This might be, you know, not biblical, okay? So don't, don't. I'm not a preacher. I don't have a degree in this. If we can't know ourselves fully, I often question if I can truly die to myself to become a follower, a true follower of Jesus, to, to die to myself, to my past, I have to know myself, which means when I go, oh, I'm really angry. I know why. I know who that is inside of me. And I can say, you know what, flesh, you don't get that voice because I died to that. And then Jesus is, you know, who you say I am is who I am. Okay. So that's kind of a, a cool little tidbit there, but get to know other men, start talking about what you're feeling. I know I hated hearing that when I was younger. But then you can get to know yourself and then you can actually work on your marriage. Yeah. Well, this has been really good. And I appreciate you all being uh, vulnerable and open with your story. I know that it's going to resonate with uh, so many of our listeners. Um, where can people go again, Kate, to learn about your ministry? And, and uh, Will, why don't you also share a little bit about 423 Communities in terms of where people can go to get info on that as well? Yeah, journeybeyondbetrayal.com would be the best place to start. All my socials are on there. All my free resources are available there. And I would really be honored if you are a woman that is walking through this. Reach out to me. I have a free call. Like even if you have nobody to talk to, like let's let's connect because that's the first step, like you said, of just being known. And so yeah, journeybeyondbetrayal.com. Awesome. Yeah, that's good. Um I'm part of a group for 10 years, uh, 423 Communities. You can Google it. It's based off Proverbs 423. .org. .org? Oh, geez. I've been in there 10 years. 423communities.org. Anyway, Google it. You'll find it. It's really, you know, we're on the top of the search. But th the point isn't to hype 423. The point is to get to get to be known, to get into a community. Yeah. And and that's that's how I found freedom. And a new marriage and a new relationship to my same spouse, who now I totally love. And she knows everything about me. And I love that where I used to hide that. So yeah. lean into that. Yeah, that's good. Well, thanks again for being with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thanks for having us. This is great. Yeah. Well, listeners and viewers, we're going to put a lot of info in the show notes and uh, try to help you take your next step towards wholeness in Christ. 
And so please reach out to us and we look forward to seeing you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio program. Take care. (laughs) 